Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Alfred's been here before. <laughs> yeah. uh, welcome to uh, the Standing Committee on Social Development. Uh, we'd like to thank the Minister of uh, Education, Culture, and Employment, uh, the briefing on culture, heritage, and strategic framework and action plan. Uh, before we start, I'll ask our, I'll actually ask Mr. Testart to open us with a prayer and then we'll introduce ourselves. Oh God, thank you for bringing us here today to work on behalf of our constituents and see that their aspirations and needs are addressed by their government. Our thoughts and prayers are with the people of Katlatichi at a, after a terrible tragedy in their community. We wish them, uh, we wish with them well and uh, pray for their families. Amen. Thank you. Karen, Mr. Tester, um, we'll get, uh, we'll introduce ourselves and then um, we'll just review the agenda and the uh, and the doctor of the Dental will start off with Mr. Blake. Good afternoon, Frederick Blake, MLA for Mackenzie Delta. Welcome. Good afternoon, Karen Testart, MLA for Camlick. Good afternoon, uh, Michael Nally, MLA for Detro. Hello and welcome, Julie Green, uh, Yellow Life Center. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Framework. Uh, Shane Thompson, Chair of Social Development and the Hindi Writing. Uh, Mr. Moses, at this point in time, do you wish to, or actually we'll just approve the agenda and then we'll review the agenda. And so it's just a one item agenda item. Uh, any questions, comments? Okay, can we have an adoption? Thank you, Sonny. Mr. Blake, uh, any doc correlation of conflict of interest? Seeing none, at this point in time, Mr. Moses, I'll get you to introduce your staff and Proceed with your opening comments. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. I am uh, pleased to be here today to discuss the culture and heritage interim action plan being undertaken by the Department of Education, Culture and Employment. Uh, today with me, I have uh, my Deputy Minister, Ms. Sylvia Hamer, uh, Assistant Deputy Minister of Education and Culture, Ms. Rita Mueller. Uh, also joining us in the back is uh, Julia Mott, the Senior Advisor to the Deputy Minister. Lynn White, Project Coordinator for Culture and Heritage Division, and um, Ms. Myla Taj, my Ministerial Special Advisor. <clears throat> During the 17th Legislative Assembly, the Department of Education, Culture and Employment was mandated to lead the development of a GNWT-wide culture and heritage strategic framework. The framework was tabled in 2015 it lays, lays out a culture and heritage philosophy for the JNWT until 2025. Input from many people across the territory through a variety of ways means the framework is inclusive and serves as a guide for harnessing the powerful connection between culture and heritage and personal well-being, community resiliency, environmental sustainability, and economic diversity. The framework outlines the GNWT's culture and heritage goals and priorities for the next 10 years, but it does not, <clears throat> does not contain specific actions because actions will change over time. Therefore, ECE will be leading the development of a series of action plans to implement the framework. The first action plan, which we will outline in the presentation today, is a short, focused plan intended to lay the groundwork for developing more comprehensive and broader action plans in the future. Mr. Chair, with your permission, I will ask my Deputy Minister to provide you with a presentation that offers more details of our plans moving forward, and I will be happy to answer any questions members may have after the presentation. Masicho, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Keener. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe everyone has a copy of the actual framework document. Um, this uh, strong culture, strong territory, GNWT culture and heritage strategic framework was actually tabled in the 17th Legislative Assembly. It was the first of its kind for the GNWT. Many other strategies refer to culture or heritage, but no single document features them as important <coughs> pillars of the GNWT's work. The framework fulfills that role. It requires all GNWT departments to align their work to a common set of culture and heritage goals. 
And today, in this presentation, I want to tell you a bit more about how the framework was created, as well as to follow that with a bit of an outline about how we intend to operationalize the framework by creating a series of action plans. So on slide two, um, one of the things that I really, um, that we get a lot of comments on actually about the framework are the, the photos and how they, how they pictorially represent um, culture and, and how it manifests itself today and, and in the past. And this slide gives you a sense of that. Uh, culture and heritage have many meanings for the framework and for this presentation. Um, culture is the evolving expression of our values. We express our values in many ways, in how we connect to the land, in the clothes we wear, the food we eat, the activities we do in our free time, and the languages we use to connect with each other every day. Heritage includes the things we want to preserve for future generations. These things could be tangible, like archaeological objects, or they could be intangible, like legends or skills. Together, culture and heritage are linked to identity, and that includes individual identity, family identity, community identity, NWT identity, and so on, and our place in the world um, as well. On slide three, um, just a bit more about the presentation and how it's, it's structured. Um, will be a bit of a refresher about the culture and heritage strategic framework, why it was necessary, how it was created, and then we'll tell you uh, a bit about how we're working with other departments for action planning, why the action plans are necessary, how many there will be, and um, a bit about why we're at the place we are with an interim action plan. On slide four, why a framework? Um, I indicated that the framework was tabled in the Legislative Assembly. It identified a gap in the way the GNWT did business. There were many activities happening across government that, be co that could be called culture and heritage, but there was little coordination between them. The GNWT recognized the importance of being culturally appropriate, and we hear that term fairly often, but there was no sense about what that means and whose culture we were speaking about when we use that term. The framework helps with this. It provides a vision, goals, and priorities for culture and heritage until 2025. In terms of how the, the plan was created, there was quite extensive engagement. There was an online survey, and we're quite proud of the, the response rate there. We had over 700 responses with 28 communities covered by those responses. There was a specific survey of youth. There were 31 focus groups. Um, that included Aboriginal governments, New Canadians, and, and others. There were 10 community visits and a series of public meetings. As well, there was other research conducted, including um, what, was, what was being done in other jurisdictions, a literature review, and a look at examples from Aboriginal governments. On slide five, um, just a bit about what the framework actually contains. It outlines five goals for the GNWT. The goals appear in Appendix B of the Interim Action Plan, which I believe you have as well. Um, so if you want to follow along, they are in, a, in Appendix B. Um, the first is respect for diversity. This goal res, res recognizes that the NWT is comprised of many diverse cultures and respect for this diversity is of utmost importance. The second is culture for well-being. This goal recognizes that culture, identity, and expressing oneself are vital for well-being at an individual level, a community level, and a territorial level. And this is uh, hopefully something that you see in some of the work being undertaken by us uh, more broadly and by health and social services, for example. Uh, the third is safeguarding heritage. This goal recognizes the importance of safeguarding the land and preser preserving historical and culturally significant things for, for future gen generations. The fourth is culture as an investment. Um, this goal recognizes that culture and heritage play an important role in the economy, for example, through tourism and in strengthening public government. The fifth goal, sub entitled Supporting Residents, uh, recognizes that individuals, families, and communities take the lead in culture. 
the GNWT often plays a supporting role for that uh, by supporting the building of relationships, providing funding and expertise. Slide six, why an action plan? Uh, the framework provides a broad philosophy, as I've said, and, until 2025, but it intentionally does not contain actions um, because these will change over time. An action plan will operate, operationalize the framework's vision. It will identify existing culture and heritage actions and how they link to the framework. It will also identify new actions the GNWT is willing to take. So how many action plans are we actually talking about? There will be three, according to what we envision um, over the life of the framework. We're starting with a one-year interim action plan, and that's what I'm going to give you a bit more information on next. Um, that lays the groundwork for long-term planning and covers 1718 uh, fiscal year. Then, and then we will have two four-year uh, GNWT-wide action plans for 2018-19 to 2021-22, and then another one for 22-23 to 25-26. Sorry, the numbers get jumbled up a bit if I try and say it too quickly. Um, each plan will inform the next and be shaped by evaluation of, of results so that we're building one off the other. Slide seven, why an interim action plan? Um, that wasn't part of our original approach, but what we found when we began planning with all the departments uh, last year was was we were having many interesting discussions about how the GNWT might become more culturally appropriate, and several departments expressed a desire to more fully digest what this would mean for them. Uh, departments asked for more time, and we listened to that request and, and determined um, that us leading the way through an interim action plan would be a good solution um, in, in the circumstances. It provides an extra year of planning time and helps us to focus our approach going forward. So what will we do in the interim action plan? Um, it's our intention to lead. We want to work closely with all GNWT departments to create a four-year action plan. We will provide tools, workshops, and hands-on assistance for this purpose. Uh, two, we want to plan for transparency. So again, this gives us the time to coordinate a monitoring, evaluation, and accountability structure so we can have each plan inform the next. It will allow us to track and report on progress as well, something that committee is obviously interested in. And uh, the third will enable us to model um, what an action plan actually can entail and what it looks like. We intend to highlight six of our own culture and heritage activities as examples of how culture and heritage link to the work that the GNWT does. Slide eight, um, and I apologize, this is a rather dense slide. Um, but listed here are the six action items that ECE has identified for the next year to serve as a model. And this is actually uh, copied from page seven of the interim action plan. It links to the framework priorities, um, and those are listed in bold on the slide. The actions shown here identify initiatives that ECE is already committed to, such as the development of an immigration strategy and the creation of an Aboriginal languages framework and action plan. The last two actions are about ensuring that um, we're maximizing already existing culture and heritage infrastructure to serve the needs of the people of the NWT. The last slide, slide nine, um, why focus so closely on culture and heritage? Because culture and heritage have deep importance in the lives of NWT residents. Culture and heritage have the power to heal, to strengthen, and to create meaningful change. The GNWT Culture and Heritage Strategic Framework and the proposed interim action plan honor this power. Thank you. Masi. Okay. <clears throat> Before we go, I must apologize to uh, our clerk, uh, Doug Chowdhury, and Megan Walsh, our researcher. I, for, I keep on forgetting to introduce them, uh, maybe, so I apologize again. Uh, at this point in time, any questions or 
comments to, to Mr. Moses' opening comments or Ms. Hainer's presentation? Well, I guess I'll ask the, you, Mr. Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank you to the uh, colleagues of the committee for allowing me to speak first. Um, I, uh, I think it's great that we're taking a deep dive into culture. Uh, it's a little concerning when we can't, when we don't have a definition that's readily available. Um, and uh, this is, you know, a key part of our who we are as a, as as, uh, as Northerners and how we express ourselves to the world and and to each other. Um, I note that uh, there's a lot. There's work in here. Uh, tied to the uh, Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Centre, which is great. Uh, why are we only focusing on that facility and not looking at opportunities to develop <laughs> uh, community cultural heritage centres or sm small-scale community museums across the Northwest Territories? Uh, our sister jurisdiction, the Yukon, has done this quite successfully. And, uh, and has, I think it gets people out of the capital and exploring the rest of the Northwest Territories and seeing what, uh, you know, and seeing that diversity. Uh, Yellowknife is, is fantastic. I love being from here. I think I've gained a lot uh, growing up here as well that you wouldn't get in another city in Canada. Um, but I think of all the experiences I've had uh, as a politician and as a, a, a public servant, being able to travel and see the date show, see the boat for Delta, um, our tourists, tourists aren't taking those opportunities as much as I think we can allow them to, and we can spread some of that economic benefit around. So uh, why, why only a focus on, uh, on the Prince of Wales Heritage Museum? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Test, uh, Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, and uh, <clears throat> this is the uh, interim uh, action plan. Uh, moving forward, we still continue to support our communities, our smallest communities that do have a lot of culture and, and heritage uh, uh, venues and uh, facilities that we can tap into and continue to support and, and work together. Uh, Prince of Wales is our, uh, our central location. Uh, we do get a lot of uh, artifacts and items that uh, go through there as well as uh, exhibits, and uh, that's, I think, the first stepping stone. And, and I think this uh, action, interim action plan right now is, uh, is a good start uh, moving forward. And uh, it allows the other departments that do have a focus in some of the smaller communities to look at the, uh, the framework itself and start developing and working together so we can do some of the things that you had mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the Minister uh, for that, those comments. I do appreciate that this is an interim action plan. I just wanted to make that concern well known. Um, in addition to what's going on at the Heritage, is this plan going to complement contemplate other infrastructure investments or, or um, uh, like a performing arts center, for example. I mean, I, I appreciate that the museum has, uh, is the centerpiece for displaying and preserving our culture, but, um, you know, in, in Yellowknife in particular, there's a, a large art, arts community and they don't have a dedicated space to work in and perform in. Um, we have a Northern Arts and Cultural Center, and they are, you know, currently sharing space with the school, more or less. It'd be nice to have a standalone building for performers, um, and we can make it a venue for tourism, a venue for residents, really put us on the map. So will this longer-term vision of the strategy contemplate infrastructure improvements and uh, funding, funding those artistic organizations? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Tester, Minister Moses. Uh, thank you. Uh, currently, we're going to be uh, with the interim action plan and moving forward, just looking at the existing resources that we have here in Yellowknife as well as in the, uh, the communities. And uh, we also do provide a lot of uh, grants uh, to artists and performers uh, that want to continue to uh, display uh, their talents and uh, continue to support uh, whatever resources that we have out there at the moment in the long term. I uh, can't uh, speak to what's in the long term, but as departments get on into the strategic plan, I think we're going to have more, uh, more discussions in those kind of areas. But that's something that would have to get on the capital planning process as well. Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to they could expand on the department's plan for the K-9 curriculum. Mr. Blake. Ms. Mueller, and it's actually on the modeling 
and it's 3B, I believe it is. Thank you. Correct, Mr. Blake? Was it the health? Curriculum. Correct. Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Neal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we are currently, as it suggests here, where we've been working for um, the past two years with health and social services to develop a new revised K-9 health curriculum because in the Northwest Territories, uh, we actually make uh, health uh, mandatory uh, a subject area for students. And so um, right this year, we have uh, what we call a small pilot, which means a number of teachers uh, um, throughout all of our different education authorities who have been um, trying out aspects of the new grade four to six curriculum that has been developed. It's still called a draft. And the reason for that is you want teachers to try it out and see what works or doesn't work and make suggestions for improvement. So uh, this is going to be delivered over uh, three years, uh, the rollout in segments. So we began in the middle with grade four to six portion. And this upcoming fall in 1718, that will be um, rolled out in what we call a territorial pilot. The following year, uh, we're going to see the JK to grade three. And then the following year, the seven to nine. And what that does is it allows for teachers to try the curriculum and teacher resource materials and contribute to making it better. Did, did, did that answer your questions? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And also, can you expand on the department's plan for a shared responsibility? Is that similar to what you just explained? Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Ms. Mueller. So the shared responsibility is a separate piece of work, and uh, that incorporates all of our nine Aboriginal languages. So the shared responsibility was a framework that was first developed through a lot of engagement in um, 2010, through a lot of different uh, uh, pieces of work that came together to make recommendations. But what we found was that uh, even though that framework was established, putting it into action, it just didn't happen the way that it could have happened in a more meaningful or, I guess, authentic way. And so um, the minister, in coordination with the two official language languages board, the Aboriginal Languages Revitalization Board and the Official Languages Board, as well as our regional Aboriginal language coordinators that every, re every Aboriginal language um, government has. Um, they've been working together for the past year to look at that uh, framework uh, to renew it. And the, that, that uh, framework um, has come in front of committee for feedback and for suggestions with the idea that uh, we were gonna, we're gonna also have an action plan that helps to support that. And uh, we have that um, uh, scheduled to be done in the fall of this year. And, so, and that's well underway, that, that work is already underway. So that is specific with Aboriginal languages and uh, the reason for the shared responsibility is it's not just the responsibility of course of ECE or the GNWT, but it takes into respect the fact that Aboriginal governments are in fact, the first uh, leaders when it comes to um, Aboriginal languages. And so, and uh, just with the new governance model of how the funding flows and, and their role and responsibility in um, developing their own Aboriginal language plans, it tries to put all of that together. And so that action plan will be coming uh, in the fall. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't have any real difficulty with this as an interim uh, action plan, but uh, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the framework itself, and one of the, the pillars in there is uh, culture as an investment. And um, uh, I'm just not sure how that's reflected in this particular uh, action plan. I, and while we're going through the budget, uh, I don't really see any new investments in, in culture. Uh, um, yeah, funding continues for the museum and so on, but um, how does culture as an investment play out in this interim action plan? Thanks, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we, um, if you see item 3D there, and we're 
were um, on that last, not the last slide, the second last slide, the dense slide. Um, we want to create a communications marketing plan to showcase the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Centre programs and services um, as a greater draw for tourists and, and others um, who have an appreciation uh, for arts and cultures and landscapes. Um, so that's, that's part of how we want to, to accomplish that in the interim action plan. There are other initiatives currently underway across government and, and MLA O'Reilly referenced them, I, I think, as, as well that, you know, there is work going on. Um, but that can't be captured in our interim action plan. Um, obviously, ITI and others have, have things to underway to promote tourism and those kinds of things that are often linked to culture and, and to heritage. Um, and when we, when we engage with ITI as part of the four-year action plan, um, presumably they will <coughs> highlight that in their portion of, of the action plan, as will other, other departments where, where relevant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Peter. Mr. O'Reilly. <coughs> Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the, the answer. I, I guess um, I'll get a little bit more specific here, maybe. Here, here's one that ECE actually has complete control over, funding for the Arts Council. When was the last time that was actually increased? It's been at the, the current level for probably close to decades. Um, is it something that the department is going to look at as increasing funding and maybe indexing it to uh, um, CPI so that we can continue to promote promote the arts through the Arts Council. Thanks, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, uh, funds have remained fairly stable there. Um, certainly, there is nothing in, in the 17-18 mains to, to change that. Um, that is something that, as part of our ongoing work in this area, we could examine but it obviously would have to be part of, of the business planning process going forward. Thank you. Mr. Natalie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, it's a, the initiative is it's fairly, fairly generally impressive in terms of uh, moving forward. Uh, I just have two questions. The first question is just a matter of principle in terms of, you know, the department striving towards, you know, achieving at least the student population in, in WT to uh, be successful students in terms of learning generally about English, math, um, the arts, and that kind of stuff, and trying to at least uh, kind of, uh, you know, put our students at uh, a good level um, academically uh, on par with other students from all over the world. Um, and that's what we're trying to do, uh, as I understand it, with this department. Um, I, I don't see um, reflection in terms of the traditional knowledge. Uh, I know in the mandate we've, you know, referenced that as uh, being something that we need to ensure that uh, you know we uphold and that we and properly reflects at least the founding principles of initiatives, especially this one here. So I wanted to understand if perhaps the Minister or his officials can maybe highlight if just how it is that uh, traditional knowledge could maybe be uh, uh, maybe become a founding principle of this initiative or not. Let's see. Minister Moses. Thank you. And uh, plan other action plans and uh, strategies that uh, we're kind of uh, weaving together to address this. We do have a traditional knowledge strategy as well. That's a different uh, piece as well as the official uh, languages uh, strategy coming forward, but um, uh, as well as the art strategy um, moving forward. But um, if um, the member would like more details, I'm going to go to uh, my deputy minister. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, um, and I think that, that um, the MLA has hit on, on a key uh, a key concern or a key issue here that as government we have a number of different kind of moving pieces out there that haven't been well connected together including the traditional knowledge uh, policy and approach and and other other things that departments and, and agencies work on 
Um, and what the framework is trying to do is to connect those together so that there is a greater awareness of how we can how we can better have complementing complementary pieces of work, how they can work together better, how we can build off of them and, and really get uh, a bigger bang for the work that we're doing in, in different areas. Um, in terms of, of the specific use of traditional knowledge within um, the ECE world, um, I can give you a, an example of, of where that is definitely valued and, and used, and that is um, our elders and schools program. That's a good example of where um, traditional knowledge is utilized every day in, in schools across the Northwest Territories. Um, and, and not specifically mentioned in, in our interim action plan. So, you know, we've picked a few things here to highlight, but that doesn't mean it's exhaustive. There are other things happening out there as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Nedley. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just always found it intriguing <coughs> that, uh, you know, the traditional knowledge in some respects is, uh, is either disregarded or completely uh, perhaps overlooked and uh, I thought this could be a key strategic pillar in terms of ensuring that this initiative was successful and that it probably reflected uh, traditional knowledge. The other point that I wanted to make is uh, in reference to heritage resources, I understand this This is a framework, this is an action plan. I'm just trying to, the, the deputy mentioned that there's some moving parts in terms of trying to move forward and. Uh, um, more likely some, some things are still maybe up in the air, but I mean, what would be the link in terms of the context of this action plan with, say, um, the Department of Lands in terms of ensuring that, uh, you know, key archaeological or spiritual sites are properly reflected in this action plan? Can uh, perhaps um, you can give an example in terms of some of the linkages with the other departments? Masi. <coughs> Uh, as mentioned in the uh, opening comments, we're still working with waiting for the departments to come on. Uh, this is something that we wanted to move on uh, quite uh, sooner than later, so the Department of BC and E took, took the lead. Uh, archaeology, uh, we're also working with the Department of uh, Aboriginal and Indian Affairs as well, looking at some uh, legislation coming forward in terms of, uh, uh, especially with a lot of the uh, self-governments that are coming down the pipe. But uh, definitely look, working with LANS, ENR, as departments come on, we can continue to work with them in areas of that focus. And uh, our department, through the uh, Prince of Wales uh, Northern Heritage Center, uh, also does a lot of good work in, in that area in terms of preservation. And for a little more detail about it. Thank you, Ms. So. Moses. Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think um, an, another good area uh, to focus on and, and um, lots of efforts uh, underway within our department already. We are responsible for issuing archaeological permits um, when, when there is activity um, within the Northwest Territories. We obviously work very closely with lands on that to make sure that there is an awareness of, of where those valuable sites are and uh, you know, making sure that's taken into consideration when making decisions about how land is used um, in, in the territory and uh, how that factors in, as the minister mentioned, how that factors into decision making around our work with Aboriginal governments and, and self-government agreements and, and the use of land within that context as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the, uh, the model actions as well, there's a, uh, an indication of ECE staff awareness training. I'm just wondering why, even at this stage, um, we're only looking for ECE staff training and not modeling broader cultural awareness training across the public service, as this is kind of designed to be an all-of-government approach. And uh, I know that this, in particular, is about residential schools and uh, um, so I'll just quote directly, gain perspective of the past and present role of the school system in the NWT and about col uh, colonialism. I think those points are important in all policy, uh, de in development of all government policy. Um, we've done some work as individuals on gender-based analysis, and I think taking a colonial-based analysis approach to 
this piece would be of benefit to the public service. Is there any uh, intention of doing that? Are we starting with DCE and then broadening it, or are we just keeping it focused on schools? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Tester, Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, uh, we did make it mandatory for all EC and E staff. That includes uh, schools. Um, we have opened it up to uh, other jurisdictions. We've also opened it up to other departments within the uh, public service, within the government. Uh, we have had good uptake. Um, in terms of uh, in the uh, elementary schools, we do have the uh, Northern Studies 10 that focuses on residential schools. And uh, as we're working on Northern Studies 20 right now, that's going to focus on some of the land claims, self-government processes. So uh, we're taking a broad, broad approach, but that uh, cultural awareness training uh, it does say ECE because uh, we have made it mandatory for our staff, and uh, but we have opened it up right across the board to anybody that wants to take it. And in fact, I, I did mention down in the House at one time that uh, we, it'd be great if members of the Legislative Assembly would be willing to take that uh, that training as well. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Tester. Um, I'm interested. I, I don't know why I haven't found the time, but I will, Minister, and I will take the training. Um, I think, I'm just thinking like in my previous, my past life working for the Department of Justice as a peace officer, that kind of training is crucial. It is crucial to our frontline corrections and peace officers to understand uh, the, the circumstances that lead many of our Indigenous uh, friends and neighbours into the justice system. And without proper cultural sensitivities around that, it can lead to some very poor uh, understandings of situations. So I'll just leave that with the department. I think it's imperative that we do roll it out, especially for frontline workers, social workers. Well, that's ECE, so. Um, or no, health, right? The Department of Health, too, that would be relevant to them. Um, by st <laughs> yeah, we could keep going. Um, so my, uh, my next point, uh, and this will be my final one, um, you know, I think language is a tricky thing, especially when uh, we're trying to revive <coughs> languages that are in decline. But the arts is a really, I, I think, important tool that we can apply to be successful in this. And we have fantastic artists right now uh, who are coming up into their own, developing their professional careers, being recognized by, by uh, national awards. If we could connect with them, our you know local artists who are really close to their culture, and use you know innovative tools uh, like um, apps on Twitter or Facebook, uh, other social media platforms. So we engage a different demographic. I think it's great to do training workshops and put it in, into our schools. But um, if we really harness the, the tools that you know, basically kids are using to communicate with one another and find a way to integrate those into this work, I think we'll be very successful. And I think the best place to start is with those, those performing artists who are already creative and uh, know how to engage an audience. Seek them out because they're the ones who are going to make the biggest impact. Um, and if we support them and focus that work, give them the expertise to focus that work and hit the points we need. But use them as your filter to understand how to express this. Uh, not a question, Mr. Chair, but I did want to leave that with the minister and his staff. Thank you. Mr. Tester, more of a comment, but I will allow Minister, minister Moses. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great idea. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, world Canadian renowned artists that uh, people recognize, so uh, that's something we'll take back to the department. But we do have, uh, uh, lang we did have languages apps that were readily available to download. Uh, we have the little iPad minis that we give to uh, new families that have uh, language apps on there as well. But uh, that was a really, really good idea, and we'll take that back to the department because we do have some uh, really well-known artists in, in the north that has put the north on, on the map. Thanks. Minister Moses, Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to go back to the first comment, um, very good points about um, the broader public service. Um, and there have been some, some discussions with uh, colleagues in Human Resources about that. Um, we have offered a train-the-trainer kind of an approach on, uh, on the history and legacy of residential schools to, that a number of departments have, have uh, availed themselves of. But obviously, um, we need to continue to focus on that to create a, a sustainable approach so that the public service can um, gain the benefit of, of this valuable uh, training and, and provide uh, more effective programming and supports to the people of the NWT as a result. Um, 
in terms of, of the second uh, item that the minister commented on as well and the use of the arts, yes, very good idea. We're noting it down. Um, and the use of technology in particular, we're, we're not perhaps uh, at the fore of that as, as we should be across government, but um, something that we need to need to think about and, and work on. Um, the other thing that um, we're certainly focusing on and partnering with uh, our friends in, uh, in ENR and in ITI is the concept of arts tourism um, and looking to try to try to build off that and, and, and uh, tap into existing artists in, in that area as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, just a very quick comment on my last question. If you didn't take it as a hint that I would like to see increased uh, Arts Council funding in the next business plans, you, you, you can take it now. So, uh, and I look forward to that. But um, I just want to talk a little bit about the uh, Heritage Centre um, here in Yellowknife. Um, you got some great staff there. One of the best things that they've done is the uh, exhibit that was. Uh, put together uh, with the Yellow Knives Denny First Nation. It's been a tremendous um, bringing together uh, of, uh, uh, you know, the local First Nation here with uh, people at the, the, uh, the museum and um, fantastic effort. And uh, um, I, I, when, I, when I do go over there, I, I do see people from the Yellow Knives actually going into the museum now, which never happened before. So, um, so my first question is, uh, um, can we find a better name? for the uh, Heritage Center that reflects uh, our northern culture uh, and identity than the current name. Is that something that's on the uh, uh, radar for the, the department? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister Moses. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I don't think it's on the radar, but it is a good suggestion. And, uh, you know, with some of the places, uh, other areas that have changed their names, like some of the schools even, uh, that might be something that uh, we'll definitely discuss and, you know, you could do something kind of unique with that, like put out a contest or something. But we'll take it back to the department and have discussions on it. Thank you, Mr. Moses. Mr. Riley. Yeah, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thanks for that. I really appreciate that. Uh, um, and I look forward to working with you on that. Um, the, we've got a tremendous asset here in Yellowknife, but we've got to find, I think, maybe I just don't know enough about this, but I think we've got to find ways to network with other heritage centers, museums, um, even some of the, uh, the uh, tourism visitor centers across the Northwest Territories, you know, develop some traveling exhibits. Um, but also that the staff there, I know that they do spend time in the communities, and when they go to communities, uh, it would be great to, if they could give talks, and uh, meet with folks and promote what we've got here in Yellowknife and develop it more as a, as not just a facility in Yellowknife, but a network of a heritage system, like as part of a heritage system across the Northwest Territories. Because I, I think, you know, we've got lots of artifacts and things here, but there's ways of building that and promoting it in, in the regions and in, in all the communities. And look, you do have fantastic staff there, and, and they know how to do a lot of this. Maybe they just need some some more support to, to do that. But I guess I'm, what I'm really interested in is how do we re revitalize that that uh, institution and reimagine it as a, as a territorial facility? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Really, Ms. Mueller. Yeah, th thank you, and thank you to the MLA because this is a priority for us as well. I'm really. Uh, I'm really excited to tell you that we have had the greatest number of tourists um, at the Prince of Wales uh, in 2016 than ever before. It's close to 60,000 tourists came through in 2016. We could get you the exact number, but that's amazing when, when you think about it. But, um, and if any of the members would be interested, we have some unbelievable travel exhibits that do go out now where we focus to be quite honest with you is our K-12 system. And so we have a whole series of different travel exhibits that the schools get for free. They don't even, they don't have, they have no shipping costs or anything. And they're also based on themes that teachers can use from um, uh, kindergarten to grade 12, depending on what they're teaching. And they're all hands-on um, exhibits. 
that the school can sign out for as long as they wanted. In most cases, in the, in the certain theme, we would have three or four of the same theme that could go out to schools that are interested. So we do have that. The second thing we do is we have an information package that we send out every fall to our, our school principals and to the staff. Uh, to our teachers uh, to let them know about all the services that we have, services online that they can um, uh, utilize uh, to, to get resources that they need depending on, again, what topics they're teaching, about the travel exhibits that we have uh, made for schools and the variety of them. But we also um, encourage them, there's lots of school trips that come through Yellowknife, either for sports or others, and we're trying to make this the stopping place for them is the Prince of Wales, is that the, the class or the team would, would go there and spend some time and, uh, and become familiar with the resources within the facility as well. On a broader community basis, um, as we get uh, changing exhibits all the time, one of the priorities uh, that the staff have is then finding ways to take mini versions of that and offering it to communities. And I just want to let you know that that's in our plans. We are doing that. And the first uh, real evidence of that will be with the RCMP exhibit that's about to be launched in uh, 2017. And uh, many versions of that will be available to every community um, and specific to that community. So if, for example, it's special constables historically that came from a particular region or community, the exhibit that would be available, uh, for example, in the SATU would highlight those SATU uh, members as well too. So we're beginning to do that. And before I go on to my next colleague here, the theme, I know that because I actually was doing a constituency tour and I had to take some stuff from some McKay to make sure it got back here so we could go on to our next community. And school trips is a big thing. I understand that in my writing anyway. So thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Nedley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, this is, um, I think it's a good initiative. It's um, this five broad goals. Um, um, what, what are the immediate actions that we might see from this department in terms of going forward on this initiative. Um, uh, as an example, there's almost a resurgence of interest of communities to rename their communities, even some communities that are advancing forward to maybe considering or contemplating the idea of renaming their schools. I mean, how would a document like this uh, help out those communities? I see. Thank you, Mr. Nedley. Ms. Mueller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, in fact, in the in the minister, I mean, in the uh, MLA's riding, uh, we are working with the superintendent uh, of education, who has brought forward the fact that in two of the communities uh, they're contemplating changing school names, for example. So, um, when when that's brought to our attention, uh, we will work with the community. We'll provide uh, the community with the, all the information, which, we, which we've recently done for two communities. And then any supports that they need to go through the process of changing the name, uh, that, that's what we do. We will help them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Minister Nedley. <laughs> Mr. Nedley. No further questions. No further questions. Okay. Uh, there's any other questions? If not, I would uh, like to thank the minister and the staff for coming. Uh, before we close, do the minister wish to have any closing comments? No, I just want to uh, thank the members for their comments and their input. Some really great ideas that were given to the department that uh, we'll take back and we'll also uh, talk with the uh, staff at the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Centre. Uh, really, like I said, some real good ideas. Uh, as you know, the North is a very diverse culture and we want to continue to promote our uh, culture and heritage from every corner of the Northwest Territory. So thank you for, for your time. And as I said, this is a very good first step and looking forward to as it unrolls working with other departments. Thank you, Minister Moses. And I think, again, thank you, staff. Uh, we'll get back to you with our feedback. Uh, oh, go ahead, Mr. Minister Moses. Yeah, appreciate uh, that you get back with, with our feedback. Uh, just before I leave, though, I just want to uh, reach out and, and ask that maybe uh, your clerk and, and my ministerial advisor can get together to work out uh, details on future um, presentations on that letter that the uh, standing committee had sent us so we can try to work out some dates. Thank you, Minister Moses. Then we'll, we'll be able to do that. So thank you again, and we'll get back to you with feedback into this presentation in this topic area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.